through the administration and, and through the Board of Regents. And uh, so we have a program. Now, we've had this program for 20 years, and there still, I believe, is one faculty person who's actually appointed to African American Studies. Uh, we have a minor. We've had a minor for 20 years, but we don't have the faculty to offer a major. The curriculum is based on people and other faculty in other departments who teach cross-listed courses, like my course in African American Religious Experience. I'm now also teaching a course on African American women that's cross-listed in Women's Studies and African American Studies, and, and I'm not the one who should be teaching that course. Uh, and and uh, so we've kind of got stymied here, and uh, we need we need to be building the program. We need more faculty, um, and we need your help. So here's a chance to be activist. Yes, Carly. I think you're making a, a very good point. We have a lot of initiatives that have started. Um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of things. I just retired also from Iowa State. Um, but the substance of, or the power to make a change isn't necessary. Isn't necessarily there. It's like having laws, but having no power to do anything, like having. <coughs> faculty, we have a program, and we don't have faculty. So it looks good, but in fact, there's a lot of work to do. I might mention one other curious development <clears throat> related to this program. <clears throat> About uh, seven or eight years ago, Iowa State University implemented a diversity requirement. All students have to, in order to graduate, have to take one course in U.S. diversity and one course in international diversity. So what has happened in some of our courses, including my African American religion course, because seniors graduate, or seniors register first, it fills up with seniors, white seniors, who haven't fulfilled that diversity, and this course fits in their schedule, so they take it to meet that requirement so that they can graduate. What this means is, students who are genuinely interested in it. I don't want to say that all the white seniors who sign up for it are not interested. I'm sure some of them genuinely are, and they choose that over other courses. Nonetheless, the consequence of this is that very few black students get into this course. So I've been trying to figure out ways to, to deal with this, like limiting enrollment to freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. <laughs> uh, like requiring that students have a course in African American studies or religious studies. Uh, now, my, I hope that requirement doesn't have the opposite effect, but if there are members here of the Black Student Alliance, I, I, I not only ask, I implore you to assist with enrollment in this course and other courses in African American studies. Even if there's a prerequisite, the rule is you can get permission of the instructor to set the prerequisite aside. Come see me, I'll sign you into the course. Pass the word, please. The voices of students can move change. So if you're stymied on your courses or any place, collectively coming together with a passion to force change can force change. The, the diversity requirement came from students, not faculty. Students brought to me. And I'm not saying we should do away with the diversity requirement, but we just didn't anticipate what some of the implications of that were going to be. So we have to figure out how to deal now with those implications. And there's a lot of really, I, don't, I didn't want to leave the impression there's nothing going on. There are a lot of things going on. Uh, it's just that, of course, uh, it may appear better on paper when you see all the things than it actually is. That's all, because there's a lot of good things going on. Uh, from my perspective, um, in my 30 years of being here, the black communities, we, we, I'm in Des Moines, we have never connected to Ames, um, and I've been doing my thing in nonprofits, consulting, traveling the world, but we never connected to Ames. One thing for us baby boomers, and I don't have an answer for you, but uh, if I had to do it all over again, I would make sure that I knew most of the people that I should have known years ago, because we don't connect. We don't connect to Waterloo. 
and we don't connect. We only got about 50,000 blacks in this whole state, and, uh, uh, and about over 3 million whites. So what I found out is that when I got educated back in the 70s, I was so excited. But I should have started going and traveling to Dubuque and Sioux City and other places and start helping those brothers and sisters who many of them never got educated. You know, I went to two graduate schools and I couldn't read and write when I left high school. So I've been very blessed to have my own consulting come and do a lot of things. I teach a lot of people around the world how to be successful. But I'm in my 50s now. If I had to do it all over again, I wish I could connect it. Because what we have now is communities like Ames, like Des Moines, like Dubuque in Sioux City with no infrastructure and no middle class to even think about. So that's the, that's the legacy. You can go to Chicago and other places, there's Hyde Park, there's middle class. Uh, you can go anywhere, you're gonna get, you're gonna get people who maybe look and smell like you, people who make the same amount of money like you. But we in our ones, I guess we were so happy to be successful that we never connected to each other. And because of that, there's an apathy we see in you all right now. Because I didn't know that you, know, you had a diversity class and white people uh, waiting to become seniors and beating the blacks out. Uh, that has nothing to do with her leadership. That's for somebody going to, to uh, the president's office and say, we're tired of this job. That ain't changed. So, you know, that's where it is now. So, I guess we, I didn't come here to put the blame on anybody because it's too late now. But I hope this generation, because this, I mean, I, George, I mean, I've been here over 100 times speaking in the last 30 years. And, I, and I, some of the people I spoke to have called me. They're very successful from all over the world because they went through George's legacy first. But George's up here by himself. When I knew George, we both were young. So if we had to do it all over again, for you young black people and whites who want to make a profession about staying here like this lady and doing things, and she's out of Berkeley. So, and she, you know, so I know her mentality could be very much to the left. But that's okay, that's a compliment. <laughs> okay. But the bottom line is, is that we got to start connecting. And you younger people, I see the intense eyes. But I've seen these insane looks for 20 or 30 years, and our, to the person back there, still hasn't grown the way it should have, culture-wise. You know, I, uh, I have a request. As I listen to the wisdom of a Spicer or a Fool, um, I'm thinking that here's a grand opportunity, so I might as well seize this moment. Uh, right now, I have the privilege of working with the status of African Americans with the state of Iowa, and I request your help to have another meeting uh, to allow us to roll out the ongoing covenant with Black Iowa. Uh, right now, um, I hear Representative Ford saying uh, that we need to learn how to work together. Well, I would like to begin to put that in practice uh, because, quite frankly, the demographic, demographics of the state make it absolutely necessary for white and black and other people to come together in order to bring about positive change. And the only one covenant with Black Iowa is just that, a movement to empower different communities across the state, like Sioux City, Des Moines, Waterloo, uh, and Fort Madison, Burlington, et cetera. Um, and as we prepare for a huge summit that will be taking place in Waterloo, Iowa this year, uh, I would uh, very much appreciate it all the support that we can get from the universities and colleges across the state, uh, beginning perhaps with Iowa State. We have a lot of people, for instance, in this room, including the, uh, you know, the Reverend Doctor and the other. Excuse me, not uh, Reverend, not Reverend. Uh, all right, all right, <laughs> all right. But, but, but my point is simply this, is that we have a lot of people empathetic with the cause. Why don't we begin to work together? And, and, and why don't we somehow coordinate so that we can have a rollout of the ongoing covenant with Black Eye right here at Iowa State. Uh, I would appreciate that opportunity. I would appreciate the privilege of having those of you who are present tonight to come back, communicate to other friends what we're trying to do, and then perhaps harness some power so that we can really make this a statewide movement that can gain the respect of not only the black constituents, but also very empathetic white constituents and all other people of color who are concerned about the plight of black Irons. I, I look forward to talking to you. I think he introduced himself. Oh. Yeah. He just yes, did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Abraham L. Funches Jr. I'm, I'm the current director of uh, the Division of the Status of African Americans with the state of Iowa. Would you be able to stay for a little bit after we end the program for people who might like to, to engage with you? Yes, absolutely. There was a comment or question back here. Um, I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier. <coughs> you talked about our generation 
um, not necessarily seeing color lines as much because we were raised or we went to school in situations where race wasn't really an issue. Um, and so my question is, how do you feel about this growing movement, so to speak, that says that racism is no longer an issue? Um, that racism doesn't exist anymore because black people now have the opportunity <coughs> to get to where everyone to quote unquote where everyone else can get, therefore racism doesn't really exist. So it's all a construct of um, a construct of people's imagination that racism still has an effect, that it's still very much an issue in our society. Um, I just want to jump in there before Mary because Mary's Republican and I'm a Democrat and this is why I think it's different. Uh, Mary made her feelings about affirmative action and that's okay because that's a, that's a Republican platform and, um, and that's okay. But this is where me and her different. I feel as though into the next three or four hundred years that we would not be equal and we need affirmative action because that's just the way it is. When I did my history book and I reread history, I found out that Shaka Zulu uh, was beating people who had guns, and that Plato had his carriers to go to Africa to see uh, about the clocks and, and, and the calendar. So when I read my black history, I recognize that one time Africa was the king of the world and the queen of the world, and the first body found, the first skeleton found in, in this world was from Africa. But what happened was, since the time of slavery and all those other things, things have been very, very negative to us. And so uh, I just think that the, the race issue is going to be around. We need a, 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 a plan field that's going to be equal. And that's why I think that when they say the race issue is going away, I could take it down to the inner city of Washington, D.C., where they will not only shoot anything that's light skinned, but probably kill it. And that's Washington, D.C., in the city where I'm from. Because those blacks there believe every, all white people are evil, and the only white people they're going to deal with is the police, and they don't want to deal with the police. There's communities in Chicago that you can't walk down the street if you're white. And there's black communities in Chicago, the, the, the Lithuanian community, that would don't want blacks to be there. In Los Angeles, East Los, East Los Angeles, I was told by my son who lives in LA, Daddy, we got to get out of here because at nighttime, these Latinas will cut our neck. So that's, that's what's happening in America on the real side. You don't hear about that. Race is an issue. So with that in mind, I feel as though that we got a long way to go. I do agree. Race is an issue, but to address your question, oh, you, you you didn't think I addressed it. <laughs> you tried. You <laughs> can do this all the time. You you have come together in school and churches and wherever as a group of people, as human people, but yet the race factor never goes away. There are people who are in authority and in charge where race is a conscious issue. Some would say it's more covert than overt. And in Iowa, I think it is. So I never want to say race will be completely eradicated because in this old man's time and my time, I don't think it will. It will always be there. But you as a people have an opportunity to make a difference by pulling yourself up to the tables of power, making change. Because you know what it's like to work together. And there's power in a diversified group of people. And that is what's needed. You can do away with the few people who have a negative mindset as it relates to race if you're in a position of power. Representative Ford is in a position of power. And you have said before, Representative Ford, when you were the only one that you could only do so much Yet, you did a lot in the state of Iowa. I think we have time for one more question or a comment. If, yes, in the back. On immigration, you know, last month or two months ago, we had the illegal immigrants herded out of Iowa in a way that reminded some of us of the things that happened in World War II in other parts of the world and in the United States. What are you, if you, both of you are prominent in the two, political, two major political parties in this state, and we're getting ready to have the caucuses here in the next year. Hillary kind of kicked it off last weekend. What would each of you advise the major candidates on the, side, on the Democratic side of the top three? And I don't know who the top three are on the Republican side, but Giuliani and, and uh, McCain. What would you advise to them about 
about immigration. Because and I'm from the South, I'm from North Carolina. Obviously, white black is what I've grown up with. But we're in a new world now. Uh, the Latino population of the state was 4,020 years ago, and now it's quadruple that. That's where we're headed. And we could also talk about Asians and, and Eastern Europeans and Africans too, but Latinos stand out the most. So, what kind of uh, advice would you give the top candidates as we enter this policy? Yeah. Thank you for that. That's a, a very timely question. Even though I'm Republican, as I told you before, I am black first. I do have a problem when we discriminate against anyone, when we show prejudices against anyone. America was founded on immigrants. Supposedly, we are a welcoming state. I think candidates have to speak to the issues that human beings want address. That is a coming together of all people in this brand new global society. The, uh, the Morning Register reported that uh, people in Iowa who did the poll said 60% is okay with a, a black, 50% is okay with a, with a woman, but only 40% would really appreciate a Latino. Uh, when I was out in California, my son was doing some things that Latinos and blacks and whites don't get along. Compton is almost, uh, you know, Latino now. Uh, uh, Watts is mostly Mexican. Things have changed. But he said, Daddy, they, they believe in one thing. They feel as though that we stole their country. And they don't believe in birth control. So let's put two and two together. Bottom line is their numbers are overwhelming to us. And there's some people who believe that they did still, that we did steal the country from them. And so with that in mind, I think that um, they are c coming back in ways that many of us never thought possible. I'm originally, me and my wife who's in the back there, we're from North Carolina. And you know, North Carolina has some of the largest increases of Latinos in the world. I mean, the country, in the country. Because of all the pig factories down there and, and the stuff like that. I feel as though that um, it's doing a kind of bad thing because in prison, blacks and Latinos kill each other pretty quickly. Uh, some of the toughest gangs in prisons are black and Latinos. And so they're trained to kill each other inside the joint. We're not trained to get along outside the joint. I would say, I, this is where me and her agree, that in this younger generation, if you all want to grow up the rest of your lives and live in communities that only look like you because you're scared, then I don't know what the hell you're in college for. I, I wouldn't give you a dime for your life. I'm going to say it again, because again, we did the Vietnam thing, make, no, make this and that. We did all those things. You know what I mean? Now the baby boomers, you see it now. You know, right now we're going to have more people retiring now than ever before. We're not going to leave you in the Social Security because we're going to keep on upping the budget because we're going to take care of ourselves. We're, more, we, we're way more selfish than most of you young kids are. And y'all can't even see it. Y'all came and voted us out. In the last election, we thought at least 30, I think 18% of young people voted. There was none. There was, I think the numbers was 20, 25. If that, if, 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 if every time you all vote, you could vote us out tomorrow. Young people, you don't even vote. Those you who have registrations here, who live in other communities, do you send your ballot back? Do you vote back home in Indiana when you're here in college? So you have the power to control the world. And as I close in this thing about Clockwork Orange, and you younger people need to see this movie, and you old birds already know where I'm going. Stanley Kubrick did a thing, and it scared the hell out of me when I first saw it, but I can see why. He said, once you get 30 years old, and this Clockwork Orange, Y'all know where I'm going. They wanted to kill everybody who's 30 and over because we was obsolete. You got some challenges. Professor, before you close out, I do want to mention three books that I, I think would be beneficial for those of you out there who love to read and you want to know about the civil rights movement from a religious perspective and just from a civil rights pers perspective. The first book that I have is entitled My Soul Looks Back in Wonder. And it's by Juan Williams. And it's a very good book. You can get it at any bookstore. I, anything you want to read about civil rights in the last 40 years and more is there. The other one is by Juan Williams. It's entitled, and it's on the New York Times bestseller, The Phony Leaders, Dead End Movements, and Culture of Failure That Are Undermining Black America and What We Can Do About It. I think you would be interested in this. This is by Juan Williams, very good book. 
And the last one, civil rights from a religious perspective, entitled This Far by Faith. And this too is by Juan Williams and Quentin Dixie. Very, very good books. Remember, in you, you can change. The power is in your hand. All of you are going to school to be transforma transformational leaders. And I think you can do whatever your passion calls for you to do. I would follow up on that by saying, come take my class. <laughs> uh, go, to the, go to ISU's library. If you haven't looked at the section on African American studies, on black politics, on the civil rights movement, you really need to do that. You might be amazed at what's in our own library. I'd also like to follow up on the question uh, that the young man in the back uh, presented to us by reminding you and us, all of us, that the last major campaign of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. before he was killed was the Poor People's Campaign organized in Washington, D.C. This was a campaign to bring together poor people from all racial and ethnic groups. He very much had moved toward a strategy of multicultural coalition building, and we need to revisit that today. A lot of things King said and did in the last two years of his life went far beyond his I have a dream speech. Unfortunately, that's what we've gotten stuck on when we observe the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. But he had much more to say than that. We need to study what King was saying and doing in his last two years, and then we need to act on it because he is ever so relevant for us today. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your participation and your attentiveness, and thank you especially for coming out.